Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is the Gospel according to St. John, beginning with verse 19 of chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of our Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do we do when our plans fall through? That's what we're going to be looking at, whether we like it or not, throughout the rest of this Easter season. What do we do when our plans fall through? And tonight we're going to ask the question, for instance, when we're locked in a room, when we're on lockdown, sheltered in, maybe at times afraid. Well, I was clicking around online. You've surely seen some of these stories, but I have a few examples bordering on the comical of what people do when their plans fall through. Here's a little note written by a young person little boy named Ben. Uh, This was shared on the internet recently. He said, um, it is not going good. My mom is getting stressed out. We took a break so my mom can figure this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it's not going good. That was pretty humorous. There's another one, another dad, who said as his son was peering through the office shade, my son discovered that I'm not really at work, but I'm working at home. So apparently they were trying to pull a fast one on on their son. Another parent said, when the world is fighting over toilet paper, my son is giving ours a bath. And then it had a picture full of, uh, in a bathtub full of, I guess, 1,800 rolls of toilet paper, soggy and wet in the tub. Another one of my favorites was a little girl with toys, some stuffed animals and balls and ribbons in what looked like the shape of a a pentagram. I'm sure this little girl didn't know that, but it was a circle with a little star. I'm sure that's what she was making. And it looked like maybe she was casting a spell in a different context. And the, the adult said, the parent said, day 10 of quarantine, and I think my child is up to something. The comic relief may last for a little while, but not forever. We may end up stressed and looking for answers, and humor can only do it for so much time. 
Today we, we realize that the place we should have looked from the very start, if I may point this out, is at your Lord and your God. Because he's perfect for this. Our Lord and our God is perfect for locked rooms, just as he's perfect for closed tombs. This is our Savior we're talking about, the one who invites you once again to look into that empty tomb. He invites you to see his peace. And just as he told the apostles that evening, those ten men, maybe there were a few more, hunkered down with them, three times he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Jesus didn't have the Apostle John write this down for no good reason. Our Savior wanted you to hear those words as well. Peace be with you. We're going to look at each of those three times together. Now, the disciples were on lockdown. Some commentators have noted that when the disciples were shut in their room, it maybe wasn't so much that they doubted the resurrection, but they didn't really understand the impact of it. They had enough testimony from the women who had been at the tomb, the Marys, Mary Magdalene, who had her moment with Jesus, Peter and John, who had run to the tomb, and the disciples who had walked their way to Emmaus and then come back and told the others that they conceivably had a good idea what had happened here. But still, their faith wavered. Still, they were afraid of the Jews. Maybe they were even afraid of Jesus. The last time some of them had seen him, they had scattered in the garden when he was arrested. And one of them had denied him. And one from their number had even betrayed him. So they were on lockdown. If the enemies of Jesus were willing to put Jesus to death, maybe they were out to find his followers and put them to death too. And so when Jesus appears among them, he, con he confirms his resurrection. He's there to tell them he's really here, and this does have impact in their life, and that they should do what they did automatically, rejoice in his peace. Um, your Lord and your God is perfect for appearing behind closed doors. It does sort of turn us to that question, why did the angel roll the stone away from the tomb anyway? Was it so that Jesus could get out? He needed the angel's assistance for that? Well, no, if, if you remember, when the angel rolled the stone away, Jesus was already gone. Jesus wasn't bound by the stone walls of the tomb. Sometimes you get pictures of Jesus running up these stairs in some kind of vast like grave, like finally he can jump out of that tomb, but... He was already gone when the angel rolled the stone away. His bandages were there, neatly folded, and Jesus had been somewhere else already. He had already gone through hell to proclaim his triumph in a, in a victory march to those who maybe counted on their own victory in hell, the, the evil spirits, the Satan and all of his demons and the lost and the forever condemned. And then Jesus was going to start his resurrection appearances. Now, if stone walls can't hold Jesus, what good are locked doors? It's very important for us to see that because um, as we hunker down in our lockdown during this coronavirus pandemic, I think there's something even more closed. It's the sinful heart. It's the sinful heart where Jesus needs to appear where the gospel message needs to have its impact, where the Spirit is working every time that the faith is proclaimed, every time that the good news of Jesus says, peace, peace be with you. And if Jesus can make his way through stony tomb walls, if Jesus can make his way behind locked doors, well, surely he can appear into your sinful heart as well. Surely this is a Savior who issues a gospel peace that is really peace between us and God. A peace that justifies us. A peace that has proved our salvation with his finished work at the cross and with his resurrection to open the gateways of life 
for you and for me and for whoever might believe. He's canceled your sins at the cross. He's, he's removed them forever. This is Easter peace. This is what Jesus meant by saying peace as he broke those hearts of stone of the apostles open and as those hearts responded in joy and rejoicing. And I want that for you too. As you are in your home, maybe not allowed to go certain places at certain times, um, it's important for you to rejoice. Rejoice in your Savior who can break through the doors of your home and the doors of a sinful heart and make you one of his own by faith. The second time Jesus says peace, he's conferring the keys. Um, He repeats words that he said earlier in the book of Matthew. I'll read them again, what Jesus said when, when he proclaimed peace in a special way. It was almost like the disciples didn't hear him the first time. They were so joyful. So he says it again. And he says, Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What a beautiful message of peace from our Savior. In the past, schooled men, theologians, churchmen, often said that only God can forgive sins. But Jesus takes that and reshapes that and puts the words of forgiveness in the mouths of all of his followers. He gives them the keys of life, the keys to heaven, the keys that not only loose the doors to heaven, but also bind the doors to heaven, locking and unlocking the way of salvation. The keys sound like this, your sins are forgiven, or your sins are not forgiven. They're literally, they're retained. Um, this, This is something that Jesus gives to the whole church, a proof positive of that, Thomas wasn't there that first night, that first Easter Eve. Um, There were just ten apostles, and he doesn't repeat it a week later, um, but Jesus gives that, that message of peace and forgiveness in the keys to his whole church. After all, we all are invited to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so as you consider your life locked down, maybe behind closed doors, Um, Wondering what to do when your plans fall through, Jesus tells you this, forgive one another. Have a forgiving attitude and a forgiving heart toward one another and seek the forgiveness of one another. What happens when our plans fall through very often, when we're close together in spaces, even with those we love, is we sin against one another. We say mean things to one another that we didn't really mean, but we still have that sinful nature clinging and sticking to us. It still needs to be drowned, and it still lies to our family members. It still gets frustrated without any good reason. It still tries to goad one another into a deeper anger and frustration, and we still sin. And so Jesus says, with his second peace be with you, take his message of forgiveness and apply it to your life. If your faith is wavering, and you don't trust in his forgiveness, those sins remain on you. They stick to you like glue, and you're on the path to hell. But if you have these keys, you seek out forgiveness, and you learn that message from your Lord, you're reminded of Jesus' work on the cross that completed our forgiveness, and you see how that's applied to you in the gospel message, and you own it for yourself, you put your trust in it, well then in sorrow and faith, you have the forgiveness of sins too. And it's important for you to share that with with anyone whom you're locked in close quarters with in these times. And when that happens, the Spirit himself is breathed on the church. He's breathed through your conversations as you use the keys. The third time that Jesus uses this term, peace be with you, he's there to convince the doubting. We've got a new tradition here. Um, For the second Sunday in a row, the disciples are talking about Jesus who is risen. It's the Lord's day. And for the second time, Jesus appears among them. Thomas wasn't present that first Easter evening. 
He doubted. He said, unless I see the marks and the wounds, and unless I put my finger in his side, then I'm not going to believe this. Kind of reminds me of last year when we had our children's message. We had all the children up here, and we were showing each other's owies and boo-boos. I think that might still be important, showing each other's owies and boo-boos, maybe a chance to bear one another's burdens and share some comfort with one another. But it had a much deeper meaning. It was Thomas' own chance to do a scientific experiment and to see how Jesus had broken the rules of science by coming back again. Even more than that, breaking the law of death, which had no hold on him because although he had been put to death, he was not subject to the old law. He was perfect in our place. And that scientific experiment is still important for you and for me. We still need to trust the science of Thomas and realize that based on his experiment, putting his hands into the wounds of Jesus, touching his hands, touching his feet, we have an apostolic witness, someone who shares with you the message that Jesus is risen. He not only has risen, he is risen. He continues to be risen. I think it's important for us to realize that this isn't just blind faith. This is a measured, testified peace that we can take into the rest of our lives. Some people might ask the question, when Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed, is he just saying, believe anything? Is he just saying that we ought to believe it just because some old person said it? I think we ought to apply normal understanding and confidence, what we would normally apply to a witness in court to what Thomas did. I haven't been there for every crime, but if there are a good degree of witnesses with a solid case and they all agree, well then it's important for us to listen to those witnesses and try and see if what they have to say is true. And not only that, this witness has the Holy Spirit behind it. And I can give you a little bit of an example in real life, not just court cases, but sometimes coronavirus has been called an invisible enemy. Now, I believe that. I believe that coronavirus is out there and it's afflicting people, and it's something to be careful about. Um, It's a good reason to wear gloves and masks and wash our hands and maintain a distance from people. I think we have to listen to what scientists have to say. Have I seen coronavirus with my own two eyes? I certainly have not. I've seen a little picture of it. It looks like a, I guess, like a big spiky ball. Um, I'm sure people have seen it in microscopes, and I trust what the scientists have to say. So if you believe in an unseen enemy, why don't you believe in an unseen victor, the person who has conquered death? Maybe you haven't seen him with your own two eyes. Maybe you haven't had a vision of Jesus Christ. I don't think a lot of Christians can honestly say that they have. But you have the apostolic witness, the testimony of St. Thomas and all the other apostles that evening. You can ground your faith on certainty, on the sure word of those who did see him. And we can trust the science, the scientific experiment of people like St. Thomas. So, Before you put down chalk in the driveway that reads, save me from my kids. Before you clock into a life that is forever locked down. Before you seal the tomb that this is all there is and when we're dead and gone, that's all. And that's it, folks, so better live your life now. Before you approach life with that kind of dour, sad, fearful expectation, Before you doubt who was there all along, focus on the peace of Jesus. It's there even now. It's at the empty tomb even now. It's in your heart even now. And his church continues to speak these words, even when our plans have fallen through. Peace be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.